Greetings again to all of you and to all of those who may be watching this online now or later. Happy Sabbath to you. So we have just two weeks until Passover. Literally, it's tomorrow night, two weeks from now. So you think about how soon that is. It's just, it seems like it's just flying by right now to me. The time is going very rapidly. So today what I want to do is, as we kind of think about and get ourselves into our Passover mindset, um, I want to take a look at three Passovers in the Bible that establish what our current beliefs are. There are fundamentally three that we need to look at. And when we look at those, we're going to understand that these Passovers provide us with the when we observe it, the why we observe it, and the how we observe it. The when, the why, and the how. The very first Passover is covered in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. These are the instructions before that last plague of the death angel passing over Egypt, killing all of the firstborn of both man and beast. So we begin here in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1, where it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So now we have God setting firmly in place the very first day of his calendar, the very first month of his calendar. It says, speak to all the children of Israel, saying, on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. So this month, the tenth of this month, the old Testament this month is generally called Abib, A-B-I-B, the month of Abib. In the New Testament, we see that it's called Nisan. So either term is, is accurate in the Hebrew calendar. So this first month, on the 10th of the month, they were supposed to take a lamb. Now, I want you to make sure that you make no If you're going to take notes, this is some, I'm going to try to highlight the things that are essential. It's a lamb of the sheep or goats. Verse 4. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor take, uh, neighbor next to his house, take it according to the number of persons, according to each man's need, you shall make for yourself account for your lamb. Now, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. This is a very important distinction. All right? So it's a lamb of the sheep or goats. It's from no other type of animal. And we noted that it has to be, so in other words, it can't be cattle. So you're not going to see a heifer or something. This has got to be a lamb. It has to be male. And it has to be of the first year. So the way they counted the first year was anywhere between the eighth day of birth to the, to the twelfth month of its life. And it could have no blemish, which means no natural imperfection, no disease, no missing or extra parts. Now in verse 6 it says, now you shall keep it, that is this, this animal, until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Okay, so we begin on the 10th by setting aside the lamb that we're going to be using of the sheep or goats. We wait until the 14th, and then it says at twilight, the lamb is to be killed by every household. It's important for us to understand what twilight is. The word is, in, I, so in my New King James, it's called twilight, but sometimes it's also called even, and in the King James, it's generally more often called even, which means evening. When is that? Well, so I, I was doing some research on what certain commentaries have to say about this, and I was surprised by the number who are Judaizer justifiers, meaning they want to justify the way the Jews do it, and it's not correct. Um, so it's generally understood today, at least, that the Jews believe that twilight begins, uh, represents, or between the evenings. The word itself means between the evenings. And that that period starts when the sun, after the sun hits its apex in the sky, which means noon-ish, 
represents its apex. And so after noon, it, to the Jews, that begins, that's its, their, what they call their first evening. And so the second evening is when it's dark, is what they, they say, so that they can be doing all kinds of things in this evening portion that they call basically daytime. But that's not exactly the way the Bible says to do it. So I like to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Over here in Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, verses 7 and 8. We have an example of the same exact word being used. Exodus 30, verses 7 and 8. Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning. When he tends the lamps, he shall burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamps at twilight... He shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So when is Aaron lighting the lamps? Is he lighting the lamps at noon? Of course not. He's lighting the lamps after sundown. The sun sets, but is it dark? No, it's generally light anywhere from 30 to minutes to over an hour. You can still see. That's twilight. The sun sets, it's dark. A window called twilight between those two evenings. That's what the Bible says. Now, just to be a little bit more clear on this, let's go back to, 11, uh, to Exodus chapter 16, where we see another example of the word being used. Exodus 16, verses 12 and 13. Where God says, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So it was that quails came up at evening, same word, and covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay all around the camp. Now, since sunset happens, and if you want to eat quail, get going. You've got this twilight period to gather, get to gather up the appropriate amount of quail. But the most conclusive understanding on this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. I'm going, to cover Deuteron I'm going to come back to Deuteronomy 16 at the end of this message to cover it more carefully. But for now, I just want to pull out this very clear understanding. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 6 says, But at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight. At the going down of the sun, at the time you came up out of Egypt. What do we call the going down of the sun? Sundown. So it's not hard to understand that the sun sets, you have a period of time before it's too dark to see, that's twilight. That period of time between those two evenings. So I want to set that straight for you. Because this is, it's really important as you start to look at how things were different in the New Testament. Okay? And the last scripture I want to make on this point establishes the day for us. Leviticus 23, 32. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 32. We go to, we, I usually go to Genesis to quote what God says. And the evening and the morning were the day. But here it says it more precisely even. Leviticus 23, 32. This is talking about atonement. One of the holy days of the feasts of the Lord. It says, it shall be to you a Sabbath, a solemn rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. It's hard to say that that, does, that that in any way could be interpreted as meaning sometime after noon all the way up to dark. This is from evening to evening makes a day. Very clear, very easy to understand. Now, the Passover was to be killed on the 14th of Abib at twilight. So we're going to go back to Exodus now, chapter 12, where we were. But I want you to think about this carefully. So if, if God says that I want you to kill the Passover between the evenings, in the twilight, that window of time, if that doesn't mean what we just read, then and they were and the Israelites killed according to the way the commentators would describe it, they would be either killing it the day portion of the 14th. And what would be wrong with that? 
The day portion comes after the night. And in the night, at midnight, the death angel comes. If we haven't killed the Passover yet and put it on the doorposts and over the lintel, we don't get spared. So it can't be that day. And if we take their interpretation to mean that it was before sunset sometime afternoon and before sunset on the 13th then, that doesn't reconcile because they didn't call that the 14th. The day doesn't start until evening, till the sun sets. And it lasts from evening to evening. So in both cases, we have a major problem here. They're either not keeping it on the right day or they're dead because they kept it on the wrong day. Okay, it's very simple when you think about it in those terms to understand which day we're talking about and which evening we're talking about is this Passover. Exodus 12, verses 7 through 9. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh that night. Okay, not the next night. Nope, that night. Roasted in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled uh, with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. So we see that it's clear there to eat the Passover the evening of the 14th, that night. The Passover lamb was to be roasted. Again, this is going to come, this is going to be more significant when we look later at Deuteronomy 16. I want to make sure that we're clear on the distinctions between these two passages. This is talking about a Passover service, which is clearly identified here as a meal. They shall eat the Passover lamb in the home. It is a meal done with the whole household, roasted with its head, legs, and organs in place. Now drop down to verse 43, and we have one more stipulation that we need to read. Uh, Chapter 12 still, 43 through 46. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. A sojourner and a hired servant shall not eat it. In one house it shall be eaten. You shall not carry any of the flesh outside of the house, nor shall you break one of its bones. So now we learn one more thing. And this is the most obvious reason why it had to be roasted. God wanted the animal intact fully intact, completely roasted, okay? It is a symbol of our Passover, Jesus Christ, who died whole on the stake. So this had to be the same as that. This animal treated exactly the same way. Now let's pick up where we left off back in verse 10 of chapter 12. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of of it until morning, you shall burn with fire. In other words, there will be nothing left. Burn everything up with the fire so that there is nothing left in the morning. You're not taking any with you. So it has to be completely consumed, which is why God said, okay, look, if you've got a small household, maybe there's only three or four of you in this household, and you've got this lamb, and it's far too big to be consumed by four of you in an evening, you need to get together with a neighbor. Do it together, and then all in one household will eat the Passover together so that you eat as much as you can, and the rest of it is all burned completely in the fire. Verse 11. And thus you shall eat it, With a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So belt on, sandals on, ready to go. Some historians think that that meant they literally kept it standing. They ate standing. I don't know if we could prove that. Uh, When I eat, I like to sit. So my guess is I might be wearing sandals, but I'm probably sitting too. Who knows? I think that's probably more, more, more likely than not. Okay. Now, this haste means with a sense of urgency. So, I, we don't do it exactly with a sense of urgency in that sense that they did, but they were about to flee. 
the next day. So there was a sense of urgency surrounding this. All right, verses 12 and 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So it's the Lord's Passover. He just told us in verse 11. It is his Passover, and he is the Lord. He is God, and we do it because he said so. Now, I want to remind you that Passover is not a holy day. And this lamb is not a sacrifice. It's a meal. There is a difference between a sacrifice and killing for a meal. This is not a sacrifice. So the head of the household is not actually sacrificing. He's killing the animal for sure, but it's not a sacrifice to God in the same way that sacrifices were given and offered to God. That's a very important distinction. Verse 22, I'm going to read, let me read verse 22 here. It says, um, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. So that had not been explained previously, had it? How do you get the blood on the doorpost? Like you hand and then smear, I guess? I, no. So we have, we have some instruction here. He says, no, 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 don't, don't do that. I can just see God. Don't do that. Uh, take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood, and use, it, and use that to strike the lintel and the two doorposts. So the doorposts are the sides of the frame door, and the lintel is the top beam. And so the blood needs to be on both those and across the top beam. Verse 23 for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come in to your houses to strike you. So you see now why it's so important that we keep this on the correct day at the correct time. If we're a day late, we miss this. We are, our firstborns are died. And, and I'm not a firstborn, but my wife is. Rachel is our firstborn, so, you know, I think about these things, like, in real time, like, what would that be like? And so, thankfully, Israel did it on the correct day, and we're spared. Verse 24 and 25, and you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you will keep this service. So, not only now, but God was anticipating that they were going to go into the promised land, not pull this whole monkey business they did with the spies. He expected them to go into the promised land, and by next year, they'd be keeping the, their first Passover in the promised land. And from there forward, they would be expected to keep and observe this Passover meal. So I want to reiterate over and over and over again to you, the Passover of the Old Testament is a meal. It is a meal shared in a single household for a family. Every family gathering in their household to have this meal. They have a lamb set aside four days in advance. And on the 14th, the evening of the 14th, they kill that lamb and then they roast it. Complete, total, and whole. It is a meal service. Now finally, what was the memorial of this original Passover? Verses 26 through 28. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. So they saved themselves by obeying God. God delivered them from the death angel by passing over their houses. And so they, and while he says, feed yourselves, enjoy a nice meal in haste, but you have been saved. And this is the memorial of the keeping of that Passover every year after that is to remember that they were passed over by the death angel. That's the memorial of the Old Testament Passover. 
the second Passover. So that first, that first Passover establishes the when for us. The second Passover establishes the how we observe Passover. And in order to do that, we need to see what Jesus Christ said and did. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. Well, I'm going to read from verse 7 through 16. Okay, Luke 22, 7 through 16. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. One of the things that can be confusing in your scriptures is that the term Passover and days of unleavened bread oftentimes gets mashed into one thing. They're not the same thing. The Passover is not a holy day. Days of unleavened bread, the first day, is a holy day. They're not the same day. And he went and he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. That's the Old Testament Passover in a nutshell. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Sidebar, really? You wouldn't find that odd? I'd find that very odd. Somebody walking in my house behind me. Anyway, you know, the Holy Spirit's got to be at work here. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom. So this obviously foreshadowed his death the next day. So we see that this Passover now, this is his final Passover, that it begins as a traditional Passover, a meal shared in a household amongst everyone there, in this case, Christ and the disciples. All of the disciples, including Judas Iscariot, had that meal together. And so we see that the Jews continued to keep this same Passover as Christ was not standing out as being different or unique and he never committed a sin. So he obeyed the command to keep the Passover. And of course, Luke records that the hour had come that, the, that when they ate the Passover. Therefore, the Passover has a definite time to be observed. And we know from the first Passover that the ordinance for the Passover placed it always on the 14th of Abib or Nisan and always at twilight or evening, which is sunset, the night before the day of the 14th of Nisan. Now, both Matthew and Mark confirm that the hour for the Passover to be eaten was at even or sunset. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 20. In other words, had they changed it? Or was Christ true to the old covenant? Matthew chapter 26 and verse 20. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Okay, you have that. Let's, let's turn over to Mark 14. And you have the second reference. So now we have... Three references that this is in the evening. Mark 14 and verse 17. Mark 14, verse 17. In the evening he came with the twelve. In the evening, after sunset, after sundown, after the sun going down. How many ways can we say this? It was sunset. Now John records the first changes that Christ made to this previously understood meal. So we go to John chapter 13. To see the changes that were made. John chapter 13. Beginning in verse 3. We're going to read through 5 and then we'll drop down to 12. 
So verse 3 through 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper. He's, it's in the meal. They're having the meal. So he, he rises from this, and he laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. And all that really means is it's a large towel, and it means to wrap or encircle around you. So I'm trying try to picture what it would be like, because he's planning on filling a basin with water, and then the, the apostles at this time, the disciples, would have been leaning on their sides, kind of in a circle around this table in the center of them. And so their feet are exposed and out there in front of them, and he would have gone from disciple to disciple with this basin. And so the towel wrapped around him makes this very easy for him to do. Certainly easier than trying to manage the towel in the basin and doing all these things to wash these feet. Okay. Dropping down to verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? I imagine that there was a, quite a bit of stunned looks in the room. Like, your master, your teacher does not wash your feet. You wash his feet, but you don't have him wash your feet. This is weird. This is, would be very, very strange. So he asks a really good question. He says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. So the person who might look at that scripture, and uh, that phrasing in verse 14, you also ought to wash one another's feet. If they looked at that as being optional, Christ says, no, because you're not greater than I am. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So we have this institution that he just now established after the dinner. And he says, this you will do from now on. You will wash one another's feet. Is he talking about randomly at any other time of year? He's talking about the Passover. This is what you're going to do from now on. You're going to wash one another's feet. Just as Christ washed the feet of his disciples. Over in Luke 22 again, we see that he made another change. Luke chapter 22. And verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay? So now he gives us a new symbol. It's this broken bread, which represents his body as it was tortured and mutilated during his crucifixion by his stripes. This broken bread represents his body and the crucifixion he endured for us. Next, Luke says, likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. When Christ's blood was poured out as his life expired, that blood represents his sacrifice, his death. The payment of our penalty for the sins we have committed were paid there by Christ. And so we have two new symbols added to this service. Three new symbols. We have foot washing, which represents Jesus Christ's humility. We have the bread, which represents his broken body. And we have the wine, which represents the death that he endured for us, paying the price for our sins. And he says here, do this as a command. And he said to do it as a remembrance. Verse, verse 20, where he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And in verse 19, he had said, do this in remembrance of me. So now we know that this is no longer going to be a memorial of the children of Israel being spared or passed over by the death angel, this memorial, this New Testament Passover is now a memorial of the death of Christ 
That's a significant change in the meaning of the day. Why we remember it as a memorial. And memorials are always kept annually, are they not? We remember all kinds of things by memorial every single year. Okay. So upon his death, he says here, the price for sin for all mankind would be once for all paid for by Christ. His blood, that means his death, brought into force the new covenant on the church that would be established just seven weeks later on the day of Pentecost. You and I are part of that new covenant early. It's inauguration day for the world will be when Jesus Christ returns. So no longer is the Passover to be observed as a meal. It's now to be observed with these three new symbols that Christ introduced at this, his last Passover. So what is the third Passover that we need to look at if this gives us everything? The third Passover simply needs to confirm that the church understood Christ's instructions and followed them. Because 20 years later, Paul writes to the church at Corinth. 20 years after the death of Christ, 20 years after Christ changed the symbols, if those symbols, if Passover and all the holy days, along with all the law, were done away with the death of Christ, then we should not see the church keeping them, as Christ actually said you are supposed to keep. But we turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. First Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. Where Paul says, for I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. He's not saying here... You know, if you do this every week, that's fine, whatever. Just make sure you're remembering me when you do it. That's not what he's saying. As often as you do it means annually. When you keep this holy day, or this, excuse me, when you keep this service. For he says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, not the Passover of Israel. You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. It is a memorial of the death of Jesus Christ. We keep the Passover with the new symbols because of that meaning that Christ gave us. Now, as I mentioned last week in the sermon, we talked about the fact that this was a Gentile congregation in Greece. They were keeping the Passover. They just weren't keeping it correctly. That's why Paul brings this up here. So go up earlier to verse 18. Where Paul says, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or, you dis or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Then he says, for I delivered to you what was given to me by Christ, the instruction regarding how to keep the Passover. They simply weren't keeping it correctly. But they were keeping it. And that establishes that we had a correct understanding in the New Testament church by Paul, 20 years after Christ's sacrifice and the introduction of these new symbols. That it's no longer a meal, as Paul just chastised them for coming together to have a meal. That's not the point of Passover anymore. That was the way you kept it under the old covenant, which signified a remembrance of what? The death angel passing over, but not the death of Christ. The new symbols do that. So stop doing it the old way and do it correctly, on the correct day, at the correct hour. Christ had changed the Passover meal eaten in one's home with the whole household in remembrance of Israel's deliverance from the death angel to a communal service in the church 
in which the brethren gather not to eat a meal, but instead to wash one another's feet and eat the symbols of unleavened bread and wine in remembrance of the death and sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. I wanted to just su summarize that for you in that very complete sentence. Th this is our understanding and this is why we do what we do and when we do it. So before I could end, there are a couple of things that have to be addressed. They're like elephants in the room to me. When did the Pharisees kill the Passover? Well, it wasn't that night. They were keeping the Passover the next day, afternoon at around 3 o'clock. So were they keeping the Passover correctly? Not on the right day. And it's a head scratcher because Christ kept it correctly. So here, here you have the example of Jesus Christ and the disciples keeping the Passover correctly on the correct day. And there's not a single question by the disciples as to why we're not doing it with the rest of the Jews. Christ doesn't even think it's important to mention it because he's keeping it on the correct day himself with the disciples. So what happened so that the Jews were keeping it on the 15th? Well, to answer that, I went back to an old article written by Dr. Ernest Martin, published, oh man, a long, long time ago. Before I, give you, before I do that, I want to take you to Ezra. So Ezra is one of my favorite books because he does a very nice job for us, helping us to understand what God had done through him after Judah was allowed to return to Jerusalem, go back to the promised land. And why are my eye not falling on this thing? Probably should have marked it in my Bible. I am a terrible example for you young people. Okay, Ezra 6, verses 19 through 22. So Ezra here records the following about their keeping of the Passover in the days of unleavened bread after returning from captivity in Jerusalem. Ezra 6.19, and the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. Ooh, we've got the right day, we've got the right month. For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, the priests, and for themselves. Then the children of Israel, who had returned from the captivity, ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of that land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. And after that, they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. So this is just evidence that the latest period of time we have recorded for us about things that were happening in Judah is by Ezra and Nehemiah. This would have been about the mid-400s B.C. And we see that as Ezra's desire was to establish the law of God as the constitutional law of the land, he also ensured that everyone was taught that law and that that law was preserved. This is the period of time in which the Old Testament came together and was canonized. And so under Ezra, God accomplished a lot of really remarkable things. So, but this is it. Malachi, who was a contemporary slightly before Ezra and Nehemiah, is the last prophet. There is no other prophet after Malachi. And so what's recorded for us in the scriptures is a complete set of books. This is the Old Testament that we have. And the last thing we have recorded about that is that Judah was keeping Passover on the 14th at evening. The days of unleavened bread begin on the 15th at evening. They were keeping the days of unleavened bread for seven days. Something happened after that. So I'm going to read from this article. This is from the Good News Magazine, April 1963. The article is titled, The Jews Do Not Observe Passover, by Ernest Martin. Quote, the answer to this question of why are the Jews keeping Passover on the wrong day? The answer to this is found in the history of the Jews in the third century before Christ. From 301 B.C. to 198 B.C., the Palestinian Jews came under the control of the Egyptians. Now, Dr. Martin here is being technically correct, but it's not very well understood that way. The Greek Ptolemies ruled in Egypt. They were ruled in Palestine by Greeks under the Ptolemies. 
and they were Hellenized under the Greeks, the Ptolemies. And so when he says Egyptians, he's talking about the Ptolemies. These Gentiles imposed their philosophies and religious beliefs upon the Jews in profusion. Dr. Lauterbach, one of the Judaism's greatest historians, admits that this period was one of religious anarchy among the Jews of Palestine. And that's in Rabbinic Essays, page 200. They accepted on a very large scale many outright Egyptian or Greek customs. The Egyptian day, customarily, or the Greek day, customarily commenced with sunrise. And that's documented by Wilkinson, volume 11, page 368. God's day, however, begins at sunset, which we read earlier, Leviticus 23, 32. This is where the trouble lay with the Passover reckoning after this period of Egyptian influence or Greek influence on the Jews. Now, while the Greeks allowed the Jews to retain their ancient calendar, there was a change, pardon me, there was a change in the beginning of the day. It became common to begin the day at sunrise. This custom was adopted and persisted among the Jews even down to the New Testament times. He writes here, we have had a personal information from the Hebrew Union College admitting this fact. With the 14th of Nisan supposedly beginning at sunrise, that puts what God calls the evening of Nisan 15 as still the beginning of Nisan 14 by this reckoning. This is where the problem arises. Even later on, when the Jews finally got back to evening to evening reckoning for the day, they refused to abandon what had become the traditional way of observing Passover. The principle, what was good for my fathers is good for me, was too strong for the Jews to leave it. So today, they are still one day out of phase with God. So I just want you to have that piece of information as a backdrop. When you read your, through your New Testament and you read through Christ's sacrifice and all the things that happen, and you see the Jews sacrificing, the Pharisees sacrificing on the 15th, the day, or the 14th during the day, at the time when Christ is being sacrificed, that's why. The last issue I want to resolve for you is Deuteronomy 16. So let's go back and get a correct understanding of Deuteronomy 16 as it differs from Exodus chapter 12. So I'm just going to read Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8. Then we'll discuss. It says, observe the month of Abib the first month of the Hebrew calendar, okay? And keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Therefore, you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord chooses to put his name. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. And no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the meat which you sacrifice the first day at twilight remain overnight until morning. You may not sacrifice the Passover within any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. And you shall roast and eat it in place which the Lord your God chooses. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. Six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a sacred assembly. To the Lord your God you shall do no work on it. Okay. What are the differences? This uses the word Passover several times, and it sounds like Passover, doesn't it? Sort of. Let's look at the differences. You shall sacrifice. The Passover is not a sacrifice. It's a service. We don't do sacrifices in the home. The herd refers to cattle. The Passover lamb must be either a sheep or a goat. You can't use cattle. Here you can use cattle. This sacrifice was a remembrance of Israel leaving Egypt. We read that. You will, you will do this sacrifice as a remembrance of leaving Egypt because you left in haste. 
The Passover commemorates Israel being saved from the death angel, which passed over their homes. The Passover is not the first day of unleavened bread, which is a holy day. The Passover is not a holy day. Twilight begins the first day of unleavened bread, which is the 15th of Abib. And here it said on the first day. Sacrifices were never to be done at home, but only where the Lord chooses to put his name. The the Passover lamb was killed by the head of the household at the home. The word roast, it says roast it. That word is incorrectly translated. It means boil. So let me ask you a question. How big a pot do you need to boil a heifer? I don't think I've, I know we don't have one that big. So what would they do? You butcher the cat, the, the heifer, and you boil it in pieces. This is very different than the Passover, which was a roasted lamb whole, completely uncut. They were to eat this sacrifice at the place where God chooses, which clearly is not the home since the next day they were to go to their tents or home. And they had to stay in their homes on Passover because it was eaten at home, and they were to stay in their home all night. Okay, so that's a difference. And since Israel did not leave Egypt on the night of the Passover because they had to stay in their home all night, Israel left Egypt the next night on the 15th of Abib, as is recorded in Exodus chapter 12. So when you just do a correlation between Exodus 12 and here, you see that this is clearly talking about the days of unleavened bread, not the actual Passover service. So if you have that understanding, then you completely see the easy, to me, it's really easy to see the difference between this and the other. They're very different services held on two different days. So all of these differences help us to understand that this is talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread and not the Passover service. As I said at the beginning, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be observing the Passover. The three Passovers we reviewed today show us when we are to keep the Passover, how we are to keep the Passover, and why we observe the Passover the way that we do today in God's church. Because we do what Christ said to do, when he said to do it, and how he said to do it.